Levant region has a rich and captivating history, but the main reason I enjoy it so much is how furtive and labyrinthine that it is. It's said that it's shrouded in mystery, and behind any mystery, one typically finds deception and conspiracy. Almost immediately upon drawing my focus to the history of this region, it became abundantly clear to me that it's veritably impossible to get totally unbiased regional history, and the reason for this is fairly obvious. With very few exceptions, the defense of either Jewish or Palestinian indigenous claims to the land follow ethno- and religio-political lines, and have thus become ingrained into the historical study of the region. At first glance, it seems that this phenomenon is modern, but in reality, it has been happening for over 2,000 years before the creation of the State of Israel. The history and archaeology of the Levant is chock full of revisionism, censorship, cherry picking, propaganda, and even unvarnished lies. And so, one must become a detective and accept the challenge of cutting through all the deception in order to decipher any truth. One of the main problems for historians and archaeologists who study this region is, because of the vast institutional power of the Jews and their Christian Zionist vassals around the world, they are routinely gaslighted as conspiracy theorists and demonized as anti-Semitic. If they dare posit theses, conduct research, and make findings that can be construed as an attempt to undermine the exclusive Jewish claim to the land of Israel. Of course, the broad pro-Palestinian camp are guilty of the same behavior, but with significantly less institutional power. Their ability to match the Zionist informational war is significantly enfeebled, and thus, so is their ability to defend their indigenous claim to the Levant region. Because the Zionist claim to the Levant region is based almost entirely on the Deuteronomistic narrative history contained within their own Bible, the traditional historical narrative of the Levant is painfully inseparable in many ways from Biblical canon. And despite the overwhelming consensus of historians and archaeologists deeming the Deuteronomistic narrative history to be mostly a series of fabricated and revisionist myths, a depressing number of Westerners, including most Western Christians, still widely accept it as canon. The Deuteronomistic history, which stretches from the Book of Deuteronomy to the Book of Kings, is widely believed to have been composed at the court of King Josiah, who reigned from 640 to 609 before Common Era, which is six centuries after the events in the Deuteronomistic narrative allegedly took place. It is also widely accepted that Deuteronomistic history was extensively revised in the 6th century before Common Era, the century directly after its composition at Josiah's court, and almost immediately after the Babylonian conquest of both Philistia and Judah, which is when the Babylonian exile or captivity took place. The entire Deuteronomistic history is themed with tales of Jewish hatred, subversion, vindictiveness, supremacism, and premeditated genocide against a group of people called the Philistines, who are the ruling power of the region called Canaan in the biblical narrative. This is notably represented in the Samson saga contained within the Book of Judges, and perhaps more famously, the story of David and Goliath contained within the books of Samuel wherein David represents the diminutive, righteous, and moral protagonist, and Goliath the giant, cruel, and immoral antagonist. David, of course, triumphs over the odds and slays the mightier man, a recurrent archetypal theme which has reverberated throughout history, manifesting itself as the Jews' delusional self-portrayal as righteous underdogs triumphing over mightier enemies who they consider immoral or inferior. So, who are the Philistines, and why did the authors of the Deuteronomistic history vilify them in such a way? These are the main questions I will attempt to explain in this video. Samuel 13.19 claims that the Philistines had a monopoly over iron production in Canaan. The Bible admits the Philistines were the superior military and economic might in Canaan during the biblical setting. After Exodus and the death of Moses, the narrative claims that Canaan was promised to the Israelites by their God, and thereafter Canaan was conquered by the Israelites under Joshua 
through a series of divine miracles and interventions. Despite admitting the Israelites were conquering the region, the authors of the Bible claim the region belonged to them because, very conveniently, they were the chosen people of their God. To fortify the Israelites' claim to Canaan, the Bible also attempts to subvert the indigeneity of the original inhabitants. On multiple occasions, the Bible portrays the Philistines as foreign invaders to Canaan. In Deuteronomy 2.23 and Jeremiah 47.4, the Jewish authors refer to the Philistines as Pelethites and claim that they were from an island called Kaftor. For centuries, Kaftor has been assumed to be the Greek island of Crete, even though there is zero historical or archaeological evidence that Philistines originate from there. This is how the traditional Western narrative that the Philistines were of Aegean or Minoan origin began, a seemingly baseless claim made by the authors of the Deuteronomistic historical narrative. The true origin of the Philistines is shrouded in mystery, and that may very well be by design, considering the Jews attempted to basically disappear them from history to fortify their claim of Canaan. The Philistines were almost exactly similar to a group the ancient Greeks called the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians originated on the Levantine coast and dominated the Mediterranean region as early as 3000 before Common Era. The Phoenicians were renowned for their maritime prowess. Such was their skill and power at sea that modern historians refer to their realm as a Thassalocracy or a seaborne empire. The Phoenicians established Carthage in what is now Tunisia in the 9th century before Common Era, and it became one of the most powerful city-states in the ancient world, eventually contending with Rome itself. The consensus among historians is now that the group the ancient Greeks referred to as Phoenicians were the same people called the Canaanites by the Jewish authors of the Bible. And why do historians believe this? Because their language, religion, and origin are all the same. Phoenician is a Canaanite language, and Phoenicians worshipped the Canaanite pantheon of gods. Both originated on the Levantine coast. Furthermore, both held militarily and economically powerful coastal realms with maritime traditions between the 13th to 3rd century before Common Era, which is consistent with the setting of Joshua and the authoring of the Deuteronomistic history. The land of Canaan, described in the Bible, is the same region of the Levant where the Phoenician Empire originated. Both the Phoenicians and the Canaanites were a multi-ethnic empire of culturally similar tribes. One of these tribes was called the Philistines. The Philistines controlled five large city-states, referred to collectively as a pentopolis, in the land of Canaan. The first known remaining historical record of the Philistines' existence is thought to be from 1150 before Common Era, when the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses III had reliefs carved on his mortuary temple in Medinet Habu, depicting his military victories over a group known simply as the Sea Peoples. The origin of the Sea Peoples is largely unknown, but they appear to have been a confederation of tribes from various eastern Mediterranean city-states. One of these groups was called the Peleset by the Egyptians. However, even though the Sea Peoples are often depicted as maritime invaders of Egypt or even pirates of sorts, the battle fought between Ramses III and the Sea Peoples in 1178 BCE, which was depicted in the reliefs at Medinet Habu, and is almost always depicted as a maritime invasion by the Sea Peoples, was actually a major land battle which was fought in Jahi, which was the Egyptian designation for Canaan. The battle was fought because the Egyptians believed the Sea Peoples intended to invade and conquer Egypt. So in all likelihood, the Egyptians were preemptively striking and attacking the Sea Peoples in their homeland, which was Canaan. After the Sea Peoples were defeated, they remained under the vassalage of Egypt until the Bronze Age collapse. An Egyptian statue from the 10th century before Common Era also mentioned the Peleset and links them to Canaan. So the Egyptians referred to these people as the Peleset. The Hebrews called them Pleshet, 
the Assyrians who ruled the Philistine Pentopolis for centuries called the area that they inhabited Palashtu, Palastu, or Pilastu. The Greeks called them Philistium. The Hittites, who spoke an Indo-European language, called them the Palestini. Because of this etymological link, some archaeologists, namely those who study the Hittite Empire, have suggested that the group called the Peleset by the Egyptians came from the Kingdom of Palestine, which is also referred to as Patin or Patina, and also Unkai by the Assyrians. This was one of the kingdoms that emerged after the collapse of the Hittite Empire. Palestine was located in what is now the coastal Turkish province of Hattai, which would have been under significant Canaanite influence during the time of the Battle of Jahi. One of the nearest regional powers to Palestine was called Ugarit, which was a Phoenician Canaanite city-state. For these reasons, Palestine has been suggested to be the origin of the Peleset, and thus the Philistines as well. So, this bit of archaeological evidence seemingly lends to the traditional and biblical narrative that the Philistines were foreign invaders who came to Canaan in the 12th century BCE. But this is only assuming that the Peleset and the Sea Peoples attacked Egypt from abroad, which they did not, and were not from Canaan to begin with which the evidence seems to contradict. If the Peleset were a simple band of defeated foreign sea raiders who didn't even arrive in southern Canaan until the 12th century BCE, why are they depicted as the rulers of a large and powerful Pentopolis, the greatest military and economic power in Canaan, and the main rival of the Israelites in the Deuteronomistic history, which is supposedly set in the 13th century BCE? an entire century before the Peleset allegedly came to the shores of Canaan. It makes no sense and suggests two possibilities. One is that the Peleset were not foreign at all, but were in fact indigenous to Canaan, likely a Canaanite tribe that was part of the Phoenician Empire. And two is that the timeline of the Deuteronomistic narrative history is fabricated. And indeed, the prevailing scholarly view is that the Deuteronomistic history is not a factual account of historical events at all. It is a fabrication. It is widely agreed that the Book of Joshua, which is essentially the account of the Israelite conquest of Canaan through a series of divine miracles, has no archaeological or historical evidence to validate it. In the Book of Joshua, the Canaanites are included in a list of nations to exterminate and later described as a group which the Israelites had annihilated. However, archaeological data suggests the Jews never annihilated the Canaanites and were in fact themselves a subcultural group that rose out of the larger Canaanite population. After Joshua and the Israelites supposedly invaded and conquered Canaan, the Hebrew Bible depicts a united kingdom of Israel and Judea forming. After King Saul and his heir Jonathan were killed in battle by Philistines, David then allegedly became king and united all of the tribes of Israel under his banner. According to most Zionist sources, David made Jerusalem the capital of his new kingdom around 1000 BCE. David was then said to have defeated the Philistines on multiple occasions and made them his tributaries. But according to Israel Finkelstein, who is obviously a Jew and a professor at the University of Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, which supposedly became David's capital in 1000 BCE, appears to have been sparsely populated at the time. Quote, over a century of archaeological explorations in Jerusalem, the capital of the glamorous biblical united monarchy failed to reveal evidence for any meaningful 10th century building activity." Unquote. Finkelstein says that if a united Israelite kingdom did exist 3,000 years ago, it likely would have been a small entity located in the highlands away from the Mediterranean coast. Even the story of Exodus, which claims the Jews descend fully or in part from Canaanites who were enslaved in Egypt and built the pyramids there, is yet another big lie that has been handed down through the generations and become a fixture in Judeo-Christian folklore. The narrative was originally fabricated by, surprise surprise, a Judeo-Roman historian named Flavius Josephus when he wrote Antiquities of the Jews 
at the end of the first century common era. Modern archaeologists do not believe the Israelites were in ancient Egypt in significant numbers at all. It has been suggested that Exodus is loosely based on the Babylonian exile, which occurred during the Neo-Babylonian conquest of the Levant from 605 to 582 BCE. The Philistinian Pentapolis was conquered in 604 BCE as a part of the same campaign. This was directly after the period that the Deuteronomistic history was written at the court of King Josiah. Josiah's son was king of Judah when it was conquered by the Babylonians. The Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and expelled the Jews. However, there is no record that the Babylonians expelled or destroyed the Philistines from the region. It is just assumed, quite suspiciously, based on the Deuteronomistic historical narrative, which was written by a people who clearly hated and wanted to destroy the Philistines, that they simply disappeared as a people at this time. Most of the exiled Jews did not even return to their homeland after Babylon was destroyed and the Persians permitted them to return to Judah. The Jews were again utterly destroyed and almost completely removed from the Levant by Rome in the second century common era, after which they were diasporized all over the known world. Yet the Philistines, who remained a distinct people through centuries of foreign rule, are said to be the people who lost their ethnic identity and basically disappeared from the historical record after the Babylonian conquest. In reality, they never really disappeared. They were mentioned less than 200 years later by Herodotus when he used the term Palestine to describe not just the geographical area where the Philistines lived, but the entire area between Phoenicia and Egypt. In other words, he was describing what is now called the Promised Land of the Jews. In the 5th century BCE, Phoenicia was ruled by the Persian Achaemenid Empire, and its southernmost city-state was Tyre. Today, the region being described by Herodotus is part of modern Lebanon, so Herodotus described everything from Tyre to Egypt as Palestine. In 340 BCE, Aristotle wrote in his book Meteorology, quote, there is a lake in Palestine, such that if you bind a man or beast and throw it in, it floats and does not sink. They say that this lake is so bitter and salt that no fish live in it, and that if you soak clothes in it and shake them, it cleans them." Unquote. This is understood by scholars to be a reference to the Dead Sea, which is now part of the eastern border of Israel and the West Bank. In 135 Common Era, the Romans adopted the Greek name Syria Palestina when naming the new Roman province that came about as a result of the merger of Roman Syria and Roman Judea. It is commonly known that the names Palestine and Palestinians are derived from Philistia and the Philistines. The Philistines were a Canaanite tribe, possibly even a member group of the multi-ethnic Phoenician Empire. They belonged to the dominant Canaanite culture and religion of the region. Archaeological inscriptions found at the ancient Philistine city-states of Ekron and Gath prove that they spoke a Canaanite dialect that was written in Canaanite script, and yet Zionists still claim they spoke an Indo-European tongue, a narrative they base entirely on non-Semitic words that they claim are Philistine, which are included in their Bible. In the book of Samuel, it says that the national god of the Philistines was Dagon, the son of Baal, the Canaanite god. Dagon is mentioned in texts from the Canaanite city-state of Ugarit, very near to the city-state of Palestine. But because this would suggest that the Philistines were Canaanites, and indeed Semitic, not foreign invaders, pro-Israel scholars have tried to make desperate arguments that Dagon is not a Canaanite god, and that the Philistines must have adopted these gods from the Canaanites they conquered, because conquerors always adopt the gods of the people they conquer, right? More likely, the Israelites were an ethno-religious cult that formed out of the greater Canaanite culture of the region. They worshipped one particular Canaanite deity called Yahweh, and eventually came to depict all the other Canaanite gods, those worshipped by the Philistines, as evil. And of course, who could forget Beelzebub, which is a bastardized name for the Canaanite god Baal. The Israelites perverted and twisted Baal into another word for Satan, which was adopted by all Abrahamic religions. 
Baal was typically depicted by the Canaanites as being horned, or even a bull, wielding a forked object, which was actually a thunderbolt. This inspired the typical depiction in Christian iconography of Satan having horns and wielding a pitchfork. The first book of Kings describes Jezebel, a princess of the Phoenician city-state of Tyre. After marrying Ahab, the king of Israel, the two attempted to institute Canaanite paganism to their subjects in the 9th century BCE. Through the centuries, the name Jezebel came to represent false prophets, pagans, apostates, and sinful evil women. The Deuteronomistic reform in the 7th century BCE established the Kingdom of Israel as a Yahwistic theocracy and banned all Canaanite gods from being worshipped at the Temple of Solomon. As most cults do, the Israelites turned on the dominant population and culture surrounding them. They subverted and demonized them and their beliefs and attempted to destroy them. When they got the opportunity, they attempted to erase them from history altogether. The Philistines being the most powerful representation of Canaanite culture in the region that the Israelites jealously sought to control were depicted as perpetually negative and evil as a result. Even the word Philistine eventually came to mean an uncultured or primitive person because of Western civilization's adherence to the Deuteronomistic narrative. You may have noticed that the Jews have continued this behavior of subverting demonizing and attempting to destroy the cultures that surround them everywhere they have gone. So now hopefully things are starting to make sense. One thing I noticed almost immediately when beginning my research of the Philistines was that an irregular amount of emphasis is always put on ensuring that the Philistines are in no way linked to modern Palestinians. I believe that the modern Palestinians are the direct descendants of the ancient Philistines. Whenever you see narratives about them being of European or Egyptian origin, it is almost invariably a Judeo-Zionist attempt to subvert the indigeneity and identity of modern Palestinians with the ultimate goal of separating them completely from their ethnic and historical link to the Philistines and the region of Canaan, thus justifying their destruction and removal from the region by Zionists just 73 short years ago. The Philistines may have descended from the Peleset, who may have originated from the city-state of Palestine, but even if this is true, the Peleset had to have arrived in the region described as Canaan in biblical sources and Palestine by classical sources before the Israelites ever inhabited or at least became a significant power in the region. Regardless of their ethnic origin or admixture, the Philistines were Canaanites. They spoke a Semitic language, they worshipped Canaanite gods, and they were a great power in the region when the Israelites were still a gaggle of jealous shepherds living up in the hills. As Canaanites, their people basically inhabited the entire Levantine coast, from modern-day Turkey all the way to Gaza. When Muslims conquered the Byzantine province, which was still called Palestine in the 7th century Common Era, the Jews were only a tiny minority of the population there and the invading Muslim Arabs didn't demographically replace the mostly Christianized population that still lived there. They only converted them to Islam. In contrast, the vast majority of the Zionists, who now constitute the majority population of Israel, came to Palestine in the last 100 years. They claimed the region as their exclusive homeland, despite their Jewish ancestors invading the region according to their own Bible then being expelled and living elsewhere for 2,000 to 2,500 years. Most of them illegally immigrated to Palestine and then began establishing illegal Jewish-only settlements there. They formed paramilitary organizations that committed gruesome acts of terrorism against British forces before claiming independence in 1948. After Zionists won independence, the Palestinians who had fled the region to avoid becoming collateral damage in the War of 1948 were not allowed back in. Most of those who remained throughout the war were either killed or forcibly relocated after the Zionist victory. Uncoincidentally, every one of the ancient city-states of Philistia was either invaded, destroyed, or its Palestinian population was expelled and replaced with Zionists during the Israeli-Arab War of 1948. 
It's almost as if the Zionists particularly ensured that Palestinians were removed from ancient Philistine sites and replaced with Jews. If committed only a year afterwards, the actions taken against the Palestinians by Zionists would have violated international law under Principle 6 of the Nuremberg Principles, which lists crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Ironically, these principles were established in large part as a response to actions taken against Jews in World War II. My assertion is that the Palestinians are the descendants of the Philistines. While they were independent or under Assyrian, Babylonian, or Persian rule, Philistines were Canaanite pagans. The Romans and Byzantines Christianized them, and they were Christian until Arabs Islamized them in the 7th century Common Era. But despite various admixtures and religious conversions, they are essentially the same people mentioned in the Bible who are indigenous to Canaan, the region that is now the modern Jewish ethnostate of Israel. And there is genetic evidence to prove this. There are basically two subclads of Y-DNA haplogroup J that distinguish the indigenous peoples of the Fertile Crescent. JM267 and JM172, commonly known as J1 and J2 respectively, are thought of as sister clads. Generally, within the Levant, J1 has a more southern distribution, while J2 has a more northern distribution. Thus, J1 is considered the Arab haplotype, while J2 is considered the Phoenician or Canaanite haplotype. But while J1 does cluster heavily in Arabs of the region, it is also the haplotype of 46% of Kohenim, the Jewish priestly caste who claim to be directly descended from Aaron, the brother of Moses. Large percentages of the modern inhabitants of the Levant, including Palestinians, Jews, Lebanese, Syrians, and Kurds, carry one of these Y haplotypes. Both are the mark of indigeneity in the region that spans well before the biblical narrative. According to a study published in June 2017 by Das et al. in Frontiers in Genetics, in a principal component DNA analysis, the ancient Levantines from the Natufian and Neolithic periods, which is the pre-biblical narrative, clustered most predominantly with modern-day Palestinians and Bedouins. At around 62.5%, Bedouins have the highest rate of J1 among all populations tested. J1 is the haplogroup of 38.4% of Palestinians and about 10-15% of Jews. The haplogroup J2 is thought to be the most prominent among the Canaanites of the Bronze and Iron Ages. Today, it is most prominent among the Lebanese and Kurds. But according to studies by Semino et al., Nebel et al., and El Sabai et al., about 15 to 25 percent of both Jews and Palestinians carry this haplogroup as well. In a study published in August 2017 by Mark Haber et al. in the American Journal of Human Genetics, the authors concluded that the overlap between Bronze Age and present-day Levantines suggests a high degree of genetic continuity in the region since at least the early Bronze Age. This suggests that Levantines during the time of the biblical narrative and modern-day Levantines are genetically very similar, and thus the genetics of the Philistines are very similar to the genetics of modern-day Levantines, including the Palestinians. In 2020, a study was released in the scientific journal Cell, which confirmed that all present-day groups in the Levant, including Palestinians, share over half of their autosomal DNA with Levantine populations from around the time of the biblical setting or before. All of this genetic evidence suggests that Palestinians descend from local inhabitants who converted to Islam after the Arab conquest of the Levant in the 7th century Common Era. Shameless propaganda has been used by pro-Zionist sources to subvert genetic studies, confirming Palestinians are descendants of ancient Canaanites. One particularly deceptive article I found was distributed by NPR, which is sadly subsidized by American tax dollars. The article was titled, DNA Study Reveals Philistines Were Originally From Europe. The Philistines, an ancient people described not so positively in scripture, went extinct centuries ago, but some of their DNA has survived. Scientists say it's helped them solve an ancient mystery. Where did the Philistines come from? NPR's Daniel Estrin reports from Jerusalem. The Philistines are the bad guys in the Bible, like Goliath who confronted David in battle. 
They arrived in the Holy Land in the 12th century BC and disappeared from history 600 years later. Archaeologist Daniel Masters of Wheaton College in Illinois says his team wanted to know more. So you'll notice that it's already presented as fact that one, the Philistines went extinct and disappeared from history, and that two, they arrived in the Holy Land in the 12th century BCE, even though neither of these things are unquestionable facts. The stories about the Philistines had always painted them as sort of these uncouth louts, and we use the term Philistine in that way today. Archaeologists who dug the ancient Philistine city of Ashkelon found that they actually had an advanced artistic culture. The Bible says the Philistines immigrated to the Holy Land from a place in the West. Their pottery suggested the Aegean. Again, this is more incorrect information. As I illustrated earlier, the suggested Aegean origin of the Philistines comes directly from the Hebrew Bible, which states that they come from Crete. It has nothing to do with their pottery, because archaeologists know that Aegean-style pottery was traded throughout the Mediterranean region, and thus gives us no evidence whatsoever of the Philistines' ancestral origin. But archaeologists found more direct evidence to sample. The bones of babies, who they believe were born to the original Philistine immigrants who came from overseas in the 12th century. So once again, they are presenting the disputed narrative that the Philistines were immigrants that came in the 12th century BCE as fact. They sent samples to a DNA lab in Germany. These babies showed distinctive patterns of DNA that we find in the European Stone Age. And as we track those distinctive patterns of DNA, we we find them in places like southern Europe, we find them in Italy or the Aegean, southern Spain, some of those places. It's DNA patterns you don't find in the ancient peoples of the Middle East. It's contemporary, direct, physical evidence that the Philistines immigrated into the region, and we're really excited that this is a breakthrough. Their research is in the journal Science Advances. Master's team also dug up another set of bones, Philistines who lived two centuries after their ancestors' migration. Their DNA shows they were intermarrying with the people around them, but they were still considered outsiders. Because in the Hebrew Bible, there are texts as late as the 8th and 7th century, and those texts remember that the Philistines came from the West and came from outside. Now the genetics back up those texts that the Philistines came from abroad. But the Philistines would eventually disappear from the area and from history, perhaps taken as captives to Babylon. Daniel Estrin, NPR News, Jerusalem. Daniel Master, the academic in the interview, was a part of the study referenced by NPR, which was part of the Leon Levy expedition to Ashkelon. The expedition was funded in large part by the Leon Levy Foundation. Leon Levy was a billionaire investment banker and philanthropist who was also chairman of the Friends of the Israel Antiquities Authority, which is an Israeli government agency. Master is a professor at the Evangelical Wheaton College, which also sponsored the expedition. Most evangelicals believe in biblical inerrancy, which means that the Bible is completely factual. So obviously this expedition is pro-Zionist and has a vested interest in upholding the biblical narrative. The team allegedly uncovered an ancient burial site found at Ashkelon, one of the ancient Philistine city-states mentioned in the biblical narrative and found that the specimens from the site contained ancient European introgression. Quote, Our analysis suggests that this genetic distinction is due to a European-related gene flow introduced in Ashkelon during either the end of the Bronze Age or the beginning of the Iron Age. So the study shows ancient introgression, which would be consistent with the biblical narrative, but even if it's true, It was an incredibly brief introgression, which suggests the people with European genetics were quickly absorbed into an already present Levantine population. Quote, Within no more than two centuries, this genetic footprint introduced during the early Iron Age is no longer detectable and seems to be diluted by a local Levantine-related gene pool. All three Ashkelon populations derive most of their ancestry from the local Levantine gene pool. Here you see the three test groups, the late Bronze Age test group and the early and late Iron Age test groups. You'll see this purple represents the European introgression of Western hunter-gatherer type genetics. It reaches about 14% in the early Iron Age and then becomes diluted by the late Iron Age. 
the Zionist researchers used this data from these ten skeletons to extrapolate across the entire Philistine population. But here is the problem with that narrative. The researchers based their findings almost completely on mitochondrial haplogroups, which are inherited from the mother. The only way to prove this introgression comes from a resettled army of European men is through Y chromosome markers. But the researchers only provided the Y haplogroups of four of the ten skeletons tested. Only one of them, R1, was a typically European Y haplogroup, and none of those were from the early Bronze Age group. Without this evidence, they cannot compare the Bronze Age groups to the Iron Age groups, so their claim falls completely flat. The European introgression they are claiming originated with the resettlement of an army of European men is actually stronger evidence that European women were introduced into the Philistine population in the early Iron Age. And this would be consistent with other studies, which have found that women from Phoenician settlements in Europe were brought to the Levant during the same time period in question, and left a genetic legacy in the modern population of Lebanon, which is the population group that shares the most genetic affinity with the ancient Phoenicians, i.e. Canaanites. It's also important to remember that while most empires in the Mediterranean collapsed during the Late Bronze Age, the Phoenician Empire was an exception. The Late Bronze Age and Early Iron Age was the Renaissance for the Phoenician Empire. By this time, they had settlements as far west as Sardinia and the Balearic Islands, regions throughout Europe with populations that had the same genetics the Zionist researchers were claiming were not found in the Middle East and were proof that the Philistines were immigrants from Europe. So this study is not evidence of an invading army settling in southern Canaan at all. It is stronger evidence that Canaanite populations in both northern and southern Canaan were intermarrying with European women from their colonies during this time period. Moreover, the idea that because the average Philistine was at one point in their history around 14% European, this means that they are European is about as ridiculous a narrative as saying that Italians are Moorish because they absorbed ancient Moorish DNA, or the English are French because they absorbed some French Huguenots into their genome. But in order to undermine Philistinian and thus Palestinian indigeneity, the conclusion drawn by the Zionist academics and their media puppets was that the specimens came from Europe. Not that they contained a minute amount of European admixture, but were still overwhelmingly Canaanite at the time of the Biblical narrative. Master instead made it seem like the entire Philistine population of the time consisted of immigrants. It's contemporary direct physical evidence that the Philistines immigrated into the region, and we're really excited that this is a breakthrough. Daniel Estrin, the NPR journalist, also lied when he said this. Master's team also dug up another set of bones, Philistines who lived two centuries after their ancestors' migration. Their DNA shows they were intermarrying with the people around them, but they were still considered outsiders. Because Recall that the study confirmed that all three Ashkelon populations derive most of their ancestry from the local population. Because in the Hebrew Bible there are texts as late as the 8th and 7th century, and those texts remember that the Philistines came from the west and came from outside. So the only evidence they're presenting that the latter population groups were treated as outsiders by the local inhabitants is based on, that's right, the Hebrew Bible. This twisted and deceptive interpretation of this study went all the way up the Zionist ranks to Bibi Netanyahu. He took to Twitter, citing the Levy Foundation study, and immediately weaponized it. Look at the language used here. What we know from the Bible, then reiteration of the biblical Kaftor myth, followed by an attempt to disassociate the Philistines from the Palestinians. Why would Bibi even have to mention the Palestinians here if he didn't know they were linked to the Philistines? If you ask me, I would say that he does know, and that he is just doing this to gatekeep and subvert the indigeneity of the Palestinians by subverting the indigeneity of the Philistines, thereby legitimizing the Zionist claim to the land of Canaan. This same type of subversion is extremely familiar to Europeans. It is the same subversion that we see coming from Eurocidal Judeo-Marxists in places like Britain, who argue that the English have no indigenous claim to England because they contain some ancient admixture from Germanic invaders. 
It is totally disgusting and deceptive propaganda aimed at rationalizing the dispossession of a targeted group's homeland. Wherever you find subversion of indigeneity, you find subversion of history. And whenever you find subversion of both of these things, you find subversion of identity. The argument regarding the emergence of a distinctly Palestinian national identity and consciousness is also divided along ethno-political lines. Most Jewish scholars claim that Palestinian identity originated around 100 years ago and was a direct response to Zionism. Palestinian scholars argue otherwise, writing that Palestinians have been acutely aware of the distinctiveness of Palestinian history and, although proud of their Arab admixture and ancestry, are also descended from indigenous peoples who have lived in the country since time immemorial, including the ancient Canaanites. But this subversion is not a modern phenomenon. The Jews have been subverting Palestinian indigeneity and national identity for over 2,000 years. It has only become more obvious recently because Zionists are still attempting to justify their invasion of Palestine and the cleansing of the region of Palestinians just 73 short years ago.